Welcome to the role of learning styles for inclusive teaching. I'm Elisa Luther. I'm the assistive technology specialist in the ASAC, which is the Academic Support and Access Center. Can you guys hear me back there for audio? Okay, perfect. All right, so why don't we get started? So today, this is our overview for the day. We're gonna talk about the different types of learning styles that our student population has the different teaching methods that you guys use in class, how do we achieve inclusion for all, and then I'm gonna have some time for discussion as well. So why don't we get started? So what are the different learning styles or preferences, since there's not a whole lot of evidence that supports learning styles, but it's more of a preference on how we like to perceive our information or obtain it. Every single one of you in here probably has a specific way in which you take in information. So we have visual, auditory, kinesthetic, but then you can also have a combination of any of those. So visual, being a visual learner, what does that mean? It means that people visually see things or visualize concepts in their mind. So they prefer things such as images, pictures, things in colors, maps, graphs, charts, so utilizing a whiteboard, a PowerPoint, or any sort of visual media that you use within your classes. So that could also be videos as well. Then we have individuals that prefer to take their information in auditorily. So this is mainly through sound or as in some individuals, sign language. Audio recordings, so if I do an ebook or anything that provides me with the auditory feedback for the content. Um, and then also lectures. Me standing up here, you guys are auditorily taking it in as well as visually taking it in. Um, but typically these individuals like to have conversations about it because it helps them process it as well. And then we have our kinesthetic learners which is they like to do whatever it is that they're trying to work through to understand that concept. So these individuals typically like to manipulate things. They typically are multitasking. Good things for them are quizzes, touchscreen, because that's very interactive. Different things such as clickers. I don't know if anybody in here uses clickers for class, so interactive quizzes um, within your guys' approach for your courses. Um, and then also videos. If you give a demonstration video and then possibly provide them with the opportunity, say maybe you teach a lab, having the ability to do hands-on to really understand that concept. Then we have combination. What's combination? Combination is maybe we prefer a little bit of auditory for certain topics and visual for others or a combination of any of these different areas. We don't necessarily just stick to one preference. Sometimes we use different preferences based on the topic that's being presented. So these are all things to keep in mind when you're building your curriculum. What types of mediums do you use to teach in class? Anybody can say, typically how do you present the information in your classes? Anyone wanna answer? Shy group, okay. <laughs> so we'll go through some of the things that I've seen and I've come across at AU, how information is being presented to our students. So typically what I see is a lot of professors are uploading content onto Blackboard, they're utilizing websites, maybe you've built your own website that you reference students to go to that has a lot of different content on it demonstrations, so maybe you're teaching a lab or you're actually demonstrating the task or tool, the concept that they're supposed to be understanding, those skill sets. Um, we see a lot of videos. How many people have utilized Kaltura on Blackboard? Raise of hands. Nobody's used the Kaltura feature? All right, so the Kaltura feature allows you to screen capture if you're demonstrating something on the computer or to actually videotape yourself while giving a lecture. Maybe you do a lecture and upload it if you're not meeting face to face. 
Um, we also do a lot with textbooks, right? That's like the basis of our curriculum or workbooks as well. I see a lot of professors that utilize different PDFs that are available online or sources through different websites that they reference students to go to to get a bigger understanding of that concept. Blogs. Some people use Articulate. And then some professors actually utilize Linda. Does anybody know about Linda? All right, a couple of hands, that's awesome. So Linda is actually a tool that we have university-wide. Everyone that has an American.edu email has access to it. And it is a plethora of different videos on pretty much anything you could possibly think of on how to utilize different tools, tips, tricks, techniques. Um, and so that is also a tool that you guys should definitely utilize. All right, key concepts that we should keep in mind when we're creating and developing our curriculum. Can we see it? Can we hear it? And can we touch it or interact with it? How are we developing these courses? So when you guys are creating your courses, it's really important to keep these three things in mind. I want this to be kind of a forward thinking approach. It's a lot easier if you build your curriculum that's universally designed instead of trying to kind of adjust it as we go based on a specific need. So when you're creating any of your documents, different styles, you should keep it to a limited number of fonts. Don't try to get super fancy dancy, utilize Tacoma and Arial and all these other ones, you really want to try to keep it to a couple basic ones throughout your presentations and or documents. The suggested fonts are Roman, Arial, Book, Antique, Com Sans, so you guys can actually read the list, I won't read them all to you. And then size, you really want to pay attention to the text size that you're doing in any of these documents. You want to do anywhere between 10 and 12 point font. Don't go any lower than 10 point. It gets really teeny tiny and strains the eyes if you're handing out handouts or they're online. So when you're creating maybe a PowerPoint or any sort of a document, I like to draw the attention to real text versus text within a graphic. So if you're doing something per se in PowerPoint and you can do the fancy dancy lettering, the word art, has anybody heard of this? It's in word as well, okay. So for that, that is actually considered an image. So it's not real text. So if I'm using something, say I'm a blind or visually impaired individual, if I'm trying to access that content, it's just going to say that it's an image. I'm not going to get that text. So there are some different techniques that I'm going to tell you guys about to correct, correct that um, so that they have access to it. And that is alt, alt tags, so alternative text. And it's a formatting feature built into Word and most of Microsoft so that you actually can provide an underlying tag that explains what that image is, even if it's just text. Has anybody actually pulled up a, power or a PDF and you go to highlight a word on that PDF and it highlights the whole page? Does anybody understand why that is? It's actually, correct. So it's actually thinking that it's an image instead of text. So essentially just like the word art, you now have an image instead of text. And so there's some different ways around that to make sure that we have access to that text instead of the computer just reading it as an image. Contrast. I provided you guys on a resource page. I uploaded my resources, the PowerPoint, everything onto the Blackboard. But their color contrast is really big for anybody visually. You know, sometimes it's really like a cream colored background with white writing that's really difficult for people to see. Um, and so you really want to make sure that there's a high enough color contrast. So white on black, black on white, um, those types of things. Really, really bold contrast. And I did provide you guys with links for a color checker. And a color checker will allow you to utilize it online, 
in a Word document, in a PDF, and then actually one of the, the top one listed on that resource page has like a little dropper. So you can actually put the dropper right over the colors that you have for the text in the background to see if there's enough color contrast in there so that it's a good visual um, so those or any of us can actually read what's on that material. Spacing, they recommend that you do 1.5 spacing instead of single spacing. This just provides a bigger gap in a space visually. Um, this also helps our students that have dyslexia um, just because it provides more of a gap to segregate between the different lines so they don't get meshed together. Color, I see this a lot, it drives me a little bit batty, but don't indicate importance based on a color of a text. Because if I'm using a screen reader, because I visually don't see, I'm not gonna get that definition of everything with the red asterisks is important, or anything indicated by red wording is important because the screen reader is not going to tell me that that text is a red color, therefore I'm not getting that content. It's also really important because red and green are really difficult for individuals with color blindness to see as well. So I try to urge people to stay away from those colors. If you want to use it, you can just say anything indicated with an asterisk is required instead of emphasizing a color. Hyperlinks. Lots of people like to hyperlink to different content out on the web. And it's really important that if you're building this into a document or a PowerPoint, there is a little space that allows you to click hyperlink, which allows you to label that link. So sometimes we see on different websites, it will say click here, click here, click here, click here on a website. Because you guys have seen this before, right? So if I pull up all the links on a page, because that's how I access it, I don't visually see them, I'm going to get a list that says click here, click here, click here. Well, I don't know which click here on the list is going to bring me to the content that I need. So it's really important that you utilize that hyperlink feature and label this is going to take you to more about astrophysics. I want to draw your guys' attention to this. It's really important. It's a really helpful and handy tool for anybody to use that's utilizing Microsoft. They have a built-in accessibility checker. And it's really handy and it will walk you through making sure that when you are creating your documents before you save them to PDF, that it is accessible. So if you go out to say like file save, you'll see right here in the info, so instead of going to print, you're going to come down here and you're going to go to check for issues. And when you click on that, it will bring up a list of different options and you want to click on check for accessibility. I see a lot of you guys taking notes. I provided the PDF from Microsoft with the step-by-step -step instructions also, so you guys will have access to that. So the accessibility checker allows us to check things like those links we were talking about. Does my document have structure to it? Are you guys utilizing the headings that are built <coughs> in within the office suite? There's heading one, heading two. This helps to, one, visually allow us to see it, but it also allows somebody that's using a screen reader to quickly access it because they can pull up all the headings on the page versus us visually scanning it. So that's really important. This is reading order. So I don't know if anybody has tried this before, but has anybody ever tried to tab through a website? Don't use your mouse. Tab through a website or your document and see how your tabs go, where your cursor goes. That's the flow essentially of your document. It's really important that we don't have the flow go from the very first point down to contact us, back up to another point or subheading. So in the accessibility checker, it will allow you to see what is our different reading order in our pages. 
So right here it says check reading order. It will tell me what slides are actually tagged to go where. So you just want to be cognizant of how your document could possibly be read if I am listening to it. We have a lot of students that prefer auditory, so they access a lot of content by having the computer read it aloud to them. So this is really important. Alternative text. This is what I talked about when we were talking about the image of the text, if it's just a graphic versus real text. So in the handy dandy accessibility checker, it will tell you if there are spaces where I'm missing alt text. So up here on the top, it says errors, missing alt text, picture three, slide 12. So it's actually giving me exactly where there's no content. It's just an image. You can click on it and it will bring your cursor to that spot so that you can actually go in and tag it so that someone has access to it. So another great feature that I want to draw your guys' attention to is additional information. Why do we fix it? And then how do I fix it? So it will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to actually create that alternative tag. Hyperlinks. It is in file all the way over to links and you click on the hyperlink and that's where it will allow you to have the full web address but then you can also add a label so that it says I'm going to astrophysics instead of www.nasa.astrophysics.com. Um, so this helps to shorten things as well, so it's not a huge hyperlink on your page that's taking up three lines of space when it could just simply take up a half of line of space also. Videos. We're seeing more and more content being provided to students through videos. So these are some key things I want you to keep in mind if you are recording a presenter in class recording yourself, you want to make sure that you have a good audio source. So a microphone, the library has um, lapel microphones that you can utilize also that plug into your computer. This is huge for hearing impairment. Also for anybody that needs to transcribe your guys' videos so that we can produce closed captioning. You also want to make sure that you are repeating questions. If you're doing it in a lecture like this, and you have somebody that asks a question, make sure if that student doesn't have the microphone, that you are repeating what that student said so that the video actually picks up that sound so we know what was being said. You can also work with the library. Um, they have all the feature-length films that if you're going to show them in class that are closed captioned. I work with a lot of staff to make sure, yes, YouTube has captions. I don't know if anybody has ever looked at them. They're not all that great. They're all right. But they do miss some things. So we want to make sure that the captions are correct. So I will actually work with staff to help create transcripts and closed caption videos it does take some time. We do need some leeway on that in advance notice. But it's really important that we're not showing any content in class that doesn't provide closed captions. This is because, one, for if you have a student, you may not have a student with a hearing impairment, but you may. However, with the dynamic that we have here at American University, we have a huge student population that is international, right? So sec English is a second language. Closed captions also help to reinforce the English language, whether it be written or verbal, to help them understand that context as well. So it works for everybody. I don't know if anybody has done this, but have you ever watched like a British television show and it's really hard because you don't necessarily understand that dialect or it's not keen to your ear. 
So closed captions help with that as well because now you're getting all that content as well. So closed captions, we're really seeing a push um, in society and in videography that closed captions should be a must. If you don't need them, that's fine. But if you need them, you can simply click a button that says closed captions and it puts them on the screen. It just makes it easier for everybody. All right, as we talked about it before, creating accessible is huge for our different learning styles and our individuals with disabilities. So I wanna hear from you guys what kind of scares you the most about creating a universally designed course? Yes. So you do what they will do. Uh, the All right, so what he said was web-based videos that are being utilized in class, some which were shown that were in different languages, where is the trade-off of making sure our students are getting the content and providing that quickly versus maybe a lag time of not having a video that's closed captioned. Me, I personally help all of the faculty here get closed captions done for students. Um, I think it's great to be able to show those videos. It's always good to kind of see if it does provide closed captions. Like I said, YouTube will create its own closed captions, but they're not always <coughs> perfect. I can work with pulling those video down, um, creating a transcript and producing them so that you have them. So we can kind of talk afterwards, I can give you my card, but I don't think that you should shy away from utilizing the mediums that you guys want to do. It's just a little bit more of the forward thinking of, all right, this video may not have closed captions. I need to make sure that I get that off to the ASAC quickly so that the students can have that. Um, we will close caption anything that's required for students um, that have to see it in class. If you have content that's like recommended videos that you suggest that the students do, we'll work with any student that does actually have an accommodation for a hearing impairment and have them pick and choose which ones they would like to see and we'll get those closed captioned for them. So you don't have to worry about that. Required, we do want to make sure that you're not really showing, especially if you have a student in your class that has an approved accommodation, we can't show any videos unless they're closed captioned. So it's great to build this in like a forward thinking so that we have time to get those captions before the date that you would like to show them in class. Does, is that helpful? Okay, perfect. Yes, you. What about the instances that you're adding it an hour before or the night before you're going to show it? And we call those instances all the time. <laughs> That's a really good question. So my recommendation would be to see or utilize sources that already have videos that are closed captioned. Are you typically utilizing like PBS or channels or stations that provide that? Okay, so here's the thing. So obviously circumstances we need to work around, right? We need to do reasonable accommodations. Typically, if you have a student, say, with a hearing impairment, it's required in class to view it, these individuals may have an interpreter present for your course in which the interpreter can sign. 
it's not ideal because if you think about you need to look at me to understand the content while something's on the video, it's really hard to try to go back and forth and get all of that content. We also provide remote cart and that is remote captioning. So as long as the captioner that's remotely not in your class has audio to you, they utilize a website and they give the link to the student so that they have real-time captionings. So if that is the case, the recommendation would be for you to split your screen and actually pull up, get the link for the remote cart captioner and they would actually interpret and type what is being said on that video. So that's kind of our workaround right now. Um, we're not going to be 100% perfect, but we can strive to make sure that our courses are accessible. So no, no fear, but anything that's like feature length film that's really super long, it would be important for us to provide the library with that information so we can get it closed captioned. Um, but like you said, if it's just a short, quick YouTube video, I would recommend, you know, provide me with that, that link so that I can pull it down. You can take a look at the transcript of, let's say, YouTube and see how good it is before you actually decide you want to show it. And maybe it's good enough where there's just a couple of words that are off. And make sure you're just turning on the closed captions before you show the video. So everybody's getting the closed captions. You don't need to segregate out that individual with the hearing impairment. But those are the couple of options that we have. But if you can provide that to me, I can make sure that I get it closed captioned so that student can re-watch that content to make sure that they're getting all of that. Is that helpful? Yes. Two questions. The first question is, does lynda.com have closed captioning? And the answer is yes. And it's on point. It's amazing. The lead time for something that you want to use for in class, what is that lead time was the question. And the lead time is as much time as you can give us as possible. Um, if it's a feature length film, make sure you're utilizing the library so that we can use that. Um, but anything that's, say, you created your own lecture and this is something you want to use repeatedly through the same course that you teach different semesters, get that to me so we can get a closed caption so that you can utilize it from here on out. Um, so I would typically say we like to have things at least four weeks in advance. If I can at least get a week, it gives me a little bit more wiggle room. Um, and if I have to outsource it, it costs a little bit less. If that can't happen, that's okay. I can do expedited turnaround if it's required. Um, and you have a student that has an accommodation in your class, I can get that turned around for you. So you don't really have to stress about it, but even a quick turnaround, I need at least 48 hours. Is that helpful? Okay, good. Do we have any other questions? Okay, let's, let's keep moving forward. So who are the resources around campus? obviously me at the ASAC. Um, I actually provide the technology for our students and I work closely um, with my whole office but I'll do closed captioning. I do alternative text for textbooks. Another thing that I want to quickly draw attention to is if you guys are utilizing sources, say you printed off a web page because you want the students to have that content and you're going to upload it as a PDF, Make sure you're utilizing it right from the source. Don't do a scan, a rough scan, um, where you kind of have like the binding in there or highlights in there or underlined text because when students that have it auditorily read to them, they use a technology that's called OCR, which is optical character recognition. So it takes it from an image into that text. It will garble all of it. So then they don't have access to it. So make sure you're doing clean scans. We do have really 
um, high definition scanners in the library. I also uploaded a good example, bad example of scans for you guys to see on Blackboard as well. So you can kind of go through that. CTRL is another great resource for you guys here on campus. Media services in the library, they do all of your feature length films, they can help you do clips, that sort of a thing. Um, and then also Blackboard and Kaltura support if you guys are deciding to create your own videos and content that you want to upload online and have students watch. If you guys are creating your own content, can you get in touch with me because I can teach you how to use um, speech recognition that's built into every computer. And so that will actually record you while you're giving your kind of maybe your recording audio on different PowerPoint slides, which will give you a rough draft so it's easier for us to create those captions. We don't have to go back through, listen to everything, and type everything out for you. So please utilize me. I'm more than happy to teach you guys about what's built into the computer to make your life a little bit easier. Um, the ASAC faculty resources. If you do have a student with a disability in your course, please come to our page. We have a lot of great information on here that will provide you with how to work with students with disabilities, what are the accommodations, what is expected of you, and we're really here to work with you. I know sometimes things get a little stressful and crazy, but we're here to try to help calm the waters and make sure that we are providing equal access to all of our students. So please utilize this link as well. And then it seems like we kind of did do the open discussion, but was there any additional questions that you guys had? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, you're ta okay, so he said he went to an open source, right, for textbooks online, um, and he actually got one that, that was accessible, correct? So there is a project going on, um, and the ladies in, do you want to stand up, actually? Do you want to introduce yourself? So if you guys didn't hear that, that's Lindsay Murphy. She works for CTRL. She's working on a project for providing students with open source materials for courses. I recommend working with her. I have worked with Lindsay before to make sure that we're looking at accessible materials. And a big rule of thumb is if you can go online, turn on text to speech, highlight text and if it reads it to you, that's good. And then another thing is do the no mouse check. Can you tab through all of the content, whether it be a learning module, an interactive module, just straight text? Can you access everything on there? If you can't, it's probably not accessible, just as a heads up. Um, but I work with Access Text Online. I work with Bookshare also to make sure that I'm getting hard copy books in alternative format so that our students do have access to that for it to be read aloud to them. Um, so we do work with the students on that, but you don't necessarily have to worry about that. But open source, the main thing, since it is web-based, you want to stay away from Flash, and you want to make sure that you can do the no mouse rule and see if you can actually highlight the text instead of it being an image. And that will give you a pretty good understanding if it's accessible. Is that helpful? Oh. 
Yeah. Like flash players. They're, so we say that um, specifically for students with visual impairments or that are blind, um, JAWS is typically what those individuals use, which is job access with speech. It's a software program that allows me to hear everything that's on my screen and navigate strictly keyboard. Obviously, the mouse is a very visual thing. Um, and the versions of JAWS are getting a lot better um, so that they can OCR PDFs and Adobe and those sorts of things. Um, but it doesn't quite work super great with Flash yet. You're getting there, um, but I would recommend staying away from it. And if you guys don't have any more questions for me, I just wanted to take my time and say thank you for coming out today. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. If you, I do have cards up here, um, so if you guys want to email me directly on any questions, I'm more than happy to help and support you guys. Um, I know it seems scary, but it's really not that scary if we can just build and plan with ex universal design in mind. Oh, and I believe you guys were provided evaluation sheets when you first came in. I know a couple people maybe possibly snuck in the back. Um, if you could come up and get an evaluation form, that would be great. Um, and don't forget to check out the resources, and I'll double check after I leave here to make sure you guys have access to them. But I did provide you with the Microsoft Web Accessibility Checker, another list of additional resources, some of which I included some Linda files, they do provide lots and lots and lots of information on there in different sections that you can go through on how do I make my Word document accessible, <coughs> how do I make an Adobe PDF accessible, and those types of things. But I'm always here to help, so feel free to, to reach out with any questions, videos um, that you guys have.